Pecker, would you knock on that door, please? Thank you. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the delay in starting this afternoon. The state is requesting to take a witness out of order. Mr. Martinez, the state may call its next witness. The uh, state calls Kevin Horn. Can you spell your last name, please? H O R N. Right here. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, God. I do. Thank you. Your name, sir? Uh, Dr. Kevin Horn. And who do you work for? Uh, Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office. How long have you worked there? Uh, almost 12 years. And what is it that you do over there at the uh, medical examiner's office? I am a medical examiner. I'm, I'm charged with examining deceased uh, individuals and certifying a cause and manner of death within the county. And in terms of your education, where did you go to medical school? Uh, the University of Maryland. And what year did you graduate? 1995. Uh, when did you begin working for the medical examiner's office again? 2001. And drawing your attention back to June of 2008, did you have occasion to conduct a medical examination on the body of Travis Alexander? Yes. With regard to an examination of an individual such as this, what are the first steps that are taken? Uh, the body is received uh, under seal. Uh, it's in a sealed body bag with a number that's unique to that case. Uh, that seal is broken in my presence. The bag is opened, and then we examine the outside of the body, uh, collecting evidence, performing photographs, and then we move on to uh, an ex external examination, documenting injuries, and then an internal examination or an autopsy. In this particular case, were there any um, uh, x-rays taken? Yes. And what is the purpose of, of the x-rays? Uh, mostly to document uh, internal trauma and or projectiles that we may need to uh, recover. I'm going to show you some uh, photographs. Take a look at uh, the exhibits 170 through 173. Do you recognize those? I do. And are these photographs that were taken as part of your medical examination of Travis Alexander? Yes. And specifically, do they include the identification photograph as well as uh, the x rays? Yes. I move for the admission of exhibits 170 through 170. Uh, Judge, I would object to one number 170. Counsel approach.
Exhibits 170 through 173 are admitted. Exhibit 170. And what is this number that's here uh, on the left here? Um, 083532, that's our, uh, our case number for the year. Is that the same as the number that came in the bag, or in the sealed bag, or is that a different number? There's an individual seal number on the bag, but the, the case number is separate from that. And this is the face identifying the individual that was brought in, correct? Yes. The uh, radiographs or the x-rays that were done in this particular case, were they done um, before you conducted your exterior examination or afterwards? Before. Let's take a look then at exhibit number 171. And what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at a frontal x-ray of the head and on the left side, I'm sorry, on the, on the right side of the uh, x-ray you can see a projectile. When you say you said the left side, that would be the left side of Mr. Alexander, correct? His left, our right, as we look at the x-ray. Uh, exhibit number 172, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a side view of the head, again, showing the projectile. And this is where the projectile ended up, correct? Yes. Is it, and it is on the left side, even though this is the right aspect. Yes, it's his, it's his left cheek area. In looking at 173, this is a radiograph or an x-ray of the uh, top or the, the, the uh, top portion or the chest portion. Why was this taken or does the medical examiner's office just take a full view x-ray of everybody that comes in? We usually do a full series of, uh, especially in homicides, we'll do a full series of x-rays to look for any sort of hidden projectiles or any sort of, uh, especially in a stabbing case, we'll look for the tip of a, of a knife or something like that, something that could harm us as we're doing the examination. And is there anything that is shown in this x-ray as it applies to the stabbing or, um, or the shooting? No, there's no metal fragments visible. As part of uh, your examination, uh, the external examination, did you take a look at the hands? Yes. Take a look at exhibits 174 through 183 and see if that depicts photographs of Mr. Alexander's hands. Yes. for the admission of exhibits 174 to 183. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibits 174 through 183 are admitted. Take a look at um, 174. Um, what are we looking at here? At the back of the right hand. Sir, one of the things that um, 
we know in this case is that the body was in uh, its home for a while or days before it was actually discovered. So are you, from, was there any decomposition that was associated with the body and are we looking at any in this particular photograph or was it other parts of the body? Yes, there was a state of what we would call intermediate decomposition or the middle stage of decomposition and it involved the whole body. And in this picture in particular, we can see green discoloration of the hand and also early uh, what we call mummification of the fingertips. And if you take a look over here on the uh, thumb, wh wh why is that dark? Or I guess in the rest of the hand? It's, it's dried. And is that part of the mummification process that you described for me? Yes. Are there any injuries to the upper portion of uh, Mr. Alexander's right hand? No. Let's take a look at uh, exhibit 175. Now the fingers are extended and we do see that there is some darkness on each of those fingers. Do you see that? Fingernail areas, do you see that? Yes. Uh, what causes that? Again, that's decompositional change. And are there any injuries on the top of the arm? Uh, there is an injury to the thumb, which I don't think is really clearly visible in this photograph. All right, let's then take a look at exhibit number 176, which shows us what? What are we looking at here? This is the palm of the right hand, and I think there may be another picture that shows this better, but there is a, an incised or a cutting injury of the tip of the right thumb. And Oops. exhibit 177, is that what you're talking about? Yes. In looking at injuries, are you able to tell whether they were made before death, after death, or at the time of death as part of the examination? Sometimes. It depends on the case. How about this one right here? Could you tell by looking at it and, and conducting an analysis whether or not this was done um, either before death, at the time of death, or after death? I think it was done before death. There is hemorrhage associated with it. When you say that there's hemorrhage associated with it, explain that a little bit uh, more to me. Um, does a, what is it that causes a person to hemorrhage if they're alive, which is what I think you're telling me? Well, if you have a heartbeat, you're going to have blood flow to an area that's injured, and so you'll have blood flow from an injury. So if the skin is cut or torn, uh, there will be a great deal of blood that will come from an injury in a living person. A deceased person will ooze some blood, um, but uh, not a great deal. So in this one right here, it is your opinion that uh, Mr. Alexander was alive when this was inflicted? Yes, taking into consideration what I said and also in context with other injuries that are on the hands. Um, and what kind of injury is this one that we're looking at? It's a sharp force injury. It's caused by a blade or a, or a sharp forced object. If an individual, let's, let's get away a little bit from a knife right now and just focus on the individual maybe who is dragged or is hit, that kind of thing. If an individual is dead, and somebody applies some force, hits them. Are they going to bruise necessarily or not? There may be something that would look like a bruise, uh, but it will not be as large or as, uh, and the color will be different in a deceased person uh, mm -hmm. because there's no blood flow to the area. So you're actually just breaking blood vessels in that area and there, whatever blood happens to be there will ooze out, but there won't be blood pumped into the area. And part of the reason I ask that is I see that there's sort of like on top of it a little bit of a darker area. Is that mummification or is that bruising? It may be a combination of both. There's some darkening underneath the, uh, the nail there, um, but in the context of the mummification, I can't really say for sure. Are you familiar with the term defensive wounds? Yes. And de define that for me, please. Uh, they're based largely on lo location in the body. If you have injuries to the, uh, the backs of the forearms or to the palms or backs of the hands, um, you can have gunshot wounds in those locations or in the case of an assault with a knife or an edged weapon, you can have uh, cuts or, or, or um, uh, incised injuries to the backs or the palms or the backs of the forearm and it's consistent with someone trying to either grab the knife or for, uh, um, uh, fend off wounds or fend off injury. And the way you described it, uh, by necessity, the person would have to be conscious and alive, correct? Yes. And is this that we're looking at, the right thumb, is that a defensive wound? Could be, yes, consistent with that. Let's take a look now at uh, exhibit number 178. What do we see here? It's the back of the left hand. And again, with the back of the left hand, if you notice this little portion right here, what is that right there? 
Uh, it appears to be what we would call a void in the blood. Maybe there's an area of pooling the blood the hand was resting in and the blood is not staining that area. Okay. But that's not an injury, correct? No. Exhibit 179. What are we looking at there? This is the back of the left hand. Do we see any injuries here or not? Uh, you can see the edge of an injury on the side below the thumb, the side of the hand, and then also on the back of the thumb. So there are two injuries that are partially visible here. And those injuries, if we look at uh, Exhibit 180, do those show those a little bit more? Yes, this is the palm of the left hand, again showing uh, from the side of the thumb um, near the wrist, there's a fairly deep wound that's going into the muscle there. There are two separate wounds of the palm uh, below the index finger, and then um, I believe there's another injury on the thumb that we've already described. Uh, in looking at these, just to the naked eye, and obviously naked eye may not tell us everything, um, as we compare those to the injury to the right thumb, these seem to be a little bit deeper. Is that true? Or yes. Not? And how deep are these in comparison to the one that we saw in the thumb? The one on the thumb is fairly superficial. It just clips off part of the nail. Uh, this is actually going into the soft tissue and the muscle beneath the hand, so it's going in a depth of about a quarter of an inch for all three injuries. And if you, if you look at this, are you able to tell us what type of blade is doing this other than that it's a knife blade? All I can say is that it's a sharp-edged object. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 181. And this has a scale to it, correct? Yes. And so, for those of us that are really not versed in, in metrics, how big would you say this one is, the larger of the two? Uh, that measurement in inches is one and three quarter inch. And this one right here, the one down there? Three quarters of an inch. Taking a look at uh, Exhibit 182, now we're looking at those first two injuries that we described, the one near the wrist and the one on the higher up on the thumb, correct? Yes. Were these also deep, this one that I'm pointing to near the wrist, was that deeper than the one on the right thumb? Yes. And if we look at 183, we have the scale there, correct? Yes. How big was that one? That was measured in inches, one and one-half inch, and on the back of the thumb, one inch. One of the things that we talked about with regard to the other injury to the right hand was whether or not they were consistent with defensive wounds. In this one, were these consistent with defend defensive wounds? Yes. And does that mean that Mr. Um, Alexander was alive at the time that these injuries were inflicted? I believe he was. Would they have bled at the time? Yes. Let's take a look at uh, exhibits 184 through 191. Are you familiar with those photographs? Yes. Do they depict the injuries to Mr. Alexander's uh, front area from the head down to, I guess it would be down to his toes, correct? Yes. I move for the admission of exhibits 184 through 191. Objection. 84 through 191 are admitted. Sir, while those are being marked, um, how tall was uh, Mr. Well, as part of the examination, is the body uh, uh, measured for height? Yes. How tall was Mr. Alexander? Uh, 69 inches. That's uh, 5 foot 9. 5 right? foot 9. 
And uh, how much did the body weigh at the time of the examination? 189 pounds. The decomposition process, does that add weight or does that take away weight or does it just not affect it much? Generally, you're, you're not going to add weight. You'll take away weight and also in a person who's been bleeding, that will also take away weight. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 184, and um, I'm interested in this area here on the right arm. Do you see that right there, this area here? Yes. That looks like it's some sort of veiny um, action going on, veins or something. Is that what that is, or is that something else? Uh, we term that marbling, and it's a decompositional change. It's uh, um, bacterial action in the small veins under the surface of the skin. How about right here in the middle of the stomach? That is what we call skin slippage. It's uh, also decompositional. One of the things that appears to be there, and that may not be so, but it appears that it's, the body is a little bit bloated. Do you see that? Yes. Um, again, is that something that's associated with decomposition, or is that really how he was in life? I do, do believe he does have a bit of bloating. Um, he may have been a slightly heavy set person in life, but there is some bloating, and that's from bacterial gas formation after death. Let's take a look at uh, Exhibit 185. On the shoulder there, do you see that? Yes. Uh, is that an injury there? Yes. Uh, how big is that injury in terms of inches? I know we have the metric scale there, but how big is that? It's on the right shoulder. Just looking at the, the photograph, you do have a, an English and a metric scale on the same side. So it's about, an, uh, each of them, the largest of them is about an inch. Is, is this a deep sort of cut or is this sort of a grazing kind of cut? Very superficial grazing injury. But it would bleed, correct? Yes. And. How about this one right here that we're looking at right there? This is that is a, characterized as a stab wound, so it's actually a, a deeper wound, um, but it actually uh, um, terminates at the breastbone, doesn't go into the chest cavity. So as it was going in, it actually hit the breastbone and did not go any further, correct? Right, yes. Would this wound have been fatal, whether uh, immediately or rapidly or alternatively longer term? Not in and of itself, no. But it would bleed, correct? Yes. We then go to the one right here. Um, first of all, how big is that one? Just, uh, just in looking at the scale, uh, it's about two and a half inches in length. It's uh, uh, transverse across the, the chest or extending horizontally across the chest, and it's also uh, it's a deeply incised wound, so the blade is going below the skin, but it's, it's not entering the chest cavity either. You used the term incised that yes. I don't think you used before. What it, how do you define incised? Oh, well, sharp force injuries are usually di divided into stab wounds and incised wounds. So a stab wound is deeper than it is long on the surface of the skin, and the incised wound is just the opposite. It's so if you take a, than it is deep? Yes, if you take a razor and cut yourself on the skin, that's an incised wound. But if you stab yourself with a knife, then that's, that's a deeper wound. And this one right here, which is sort of below the chin and down here to the sort of the median, can you tell me a little bit about that in terms of whether or not this is a stab wound, whether or not this is an incised wound? Can you tell me about that? That's a stab wound, and I do think we do have better views of it. But uh, that one actually penetrates a, a major vessel uh, coming into the heart. Let me, let me show you then Exhibit 186. Is that the better view of it? Yes. You said something about it going into the vessel of the heart. Um, why don't you explain to us a little bit about what the heart is and whether or not, when you said that it stabbed the vessel of the heart, whether it actually hit the heart, whether it hit the, the pericardium is what surrounds the heart, right? The sac around the heart. The sac. Yes. Whether it hit that, if you could just sort of explain that one to us. But I do want to clarify first on the photograph that it's the lower of the two wounds there, so not the one next to the scale, but the right, one so below it's this it one that we're talking is the about. one that goes into the vessel. Um, what this actually does is it goes through um, uh, the cartilage 
uh, between the ribs and the breastbone, there's some softer cartilage, especially in young people. And this knife has penetrated that cartilage and gone through the sac that surrounds the heart, which is the pericardial sac, and it has perforated or passed through the superior vena cava, which is a major vein that comes down from the upper body and the head and drains into the heart. And then from there, the heart beats and pushes the blood elsewhere in the body. But it's a, it's a major vessel. With regard to that major vessel, and I was talking about the, the, the tissue that encases the heart, is that vein inside that tissue that encases the heart, or is it outside, on top of it? Where, where, where it would starts it out outside and enters the sac and then enters the heart, which is fully within that sac. And this knife wound, did it penetrate the sac and hit this vein or not? Yes. So what happens when a stand, or when a knife goes in and, and causes this amount of damage or this type of damage? Well, depending on the position of the body, uh, you may have significant internal bleeding. Um, or if the person is leaning forward, they may bleed outside of the body because there is a track leading from that vessel outside. Um, but this is a major vessel. Uh, it's not going to bleed as fast as an artery, but it will bleed a considerable amount. With regard to this considerable, considerable amount of bleeding that's going on, is this a wound that could kill this person? Yes. And do you have an estimate or is there any science out there that tells you, well, this type of wound, <laughs> given what I know about it, would take X amount of time? No, it depends on so many factors. It depends on the person's health. It depends on care that they receive. It depends on their blood volume to begin with and the position of their body. Also, with regard to a situation like that, what if we have a person who's asleep, relaxed, versus an individual who's animated, jumping up and running around? Does that affect the amount of blood that is being lost and how quickly the blood is being lost? Yes, a person in action is going to have a rapidly beating heart and they will lose blood more quickly. And other than the blood coming after here, we know that these others have bled also, correct? Yes. This one above and this one. Would any of these injuries, would, and for the example this one, would what we associate with television, would blood come out of the mouth, the ears, or, or just out of the chest area? It depends on what's hit inside the body. Um, if the lung was nicked, um, which is possible in this case because we're dealing with a decomposed body, so the, 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 the organs aren't as pristine, they're not as, uh, they don't lend themselves to examination as in a fresh um, individual. Um, but if the, blood, if the lung is nicked, they can cough up blood. Um, if you uh, have blood going into the throat area, and he does have you know, throat injuries as well, which we'll talk about, um, all those can cause coughing up of blood or loss of blood out of the mouth and the nose. There is death and then there's also unconsciousness, correct? Those are two different things, right? Yes. With regard to this particular wound that's here at the bottom, is that something that would, once it's inflicted, would that cause Mr. Alexander <clears throat> to lapse into unconsciousness? Eventually, yes, not immediately. When you say eventually, uh, do you have an estimate, uh, maybe minute, seconds, uh, between the time of infliction and the time that he would lapse into unconsciousness? If that were the only wound, and it's not, um, probably a few minutes, because we're dealing with a vein and not an artery, so it's a lower pressure system, so blood loss is slower. And how about if you take a look at that injury in connection with the things that we've seen with regard to his hands, the defensive wounds that we've talked about, does that tell you or at least in terms of time, does that indicate whether or not there was at least enough time for Mr. Alexander to attempt to defend himself and then get these other wounds to the hand? With this wound to the heart, he, he should have been able to get his hands up and <clears throat> attempt to defend himself. If he was in a seated position when this wound was inflicted, would he have the ability, even though this was inflicted, to get up and walk somewhere or move quickly somewhere, as a matter of fact? Yes. Exhibit number 187 shows us the injury to the right shoulder. Do you see that? Yes. Looks more like a scratch, doesn't it? It's very superficial, yes. Do any of these injuries, uh, including the one to exhibit 186, in exhibit 186, do any of these speak to movement or anything like that, or is just that's not something that these photographs show? Since they're on multiple parts of the body, they imply a motion of the assailant or a motion of the decedent, and I can't say which of those is the case. 
Exhibit 184, we do have the lower portion of uh, his body, correct? The lower part of the abdomen. Right. And we have this injury here, right? And then yes. we have these, right? Yes. If we go to Exhibit 188, is that a close-up of them? Yes. Um, what are these down here to the, as we look at it, to the lower part of his belly button? There's a, another photograph which may not be entered into evidence, but there's a, a, a wound track that extends across the front of the belly from where this stab enters. So some of that, what you're seeing is blood actually appearing on the surface of the skin because of this, this track where the stab wound went is very close to the surface of the skin. So what I think you're saying with regard to this stab wound is that it went something like that. Yes. And so if we do that from the opening to the longest one, how, how far is that? I gave a maximum wound track depth of about five and three quarter inches. Dr. Horn is referring to his report. Can you have that marked, please? Do you want to mark yours or do you want to mark another one? It's the same report, so. I think we have one marked. Uh, I guess from now on, if you want to refer to your report, you can find it. We were talking about the length of this one, and this one is, I think it's at five and three quarters? Yes. What is the angle of that? Uh, it's across the body from left to right and slightly downwards. So it's sort of uh, came sort of from the side right here, yes. correct? And was he alive at the time that this happened, or was he deceased at that time? More likely than not alive, since there is bleeding associated with the wound. And you're talking about this down here, the bruising that's down here, correct? Yes. Is this area in the belly button, is that also associated with the stab wound? Yes, it's going across the navel. Exhibit 189, we're now looking at the lower portion of uh, his body. Right? Yes. And not to be indelicate, was there any decomposition in the uh, testicular area, that sort of part of his body? Yeah, it's usual to see some drying there and some early mummification, and that right. is present, yes. And um, what, let's start with the right leg. What are we looking at there? Uh, apart from some decomposition changes, he also has uh, some, some contusions or bruises on the shin area. Right, right here, is that correct? On the right shin, yes. Uh, let's take a look at uh, 191, does that show it better? Yes. And the question is, is the same, was, were these injuries here, were these inflicted here, at the time of death, before death, after death, can you tell? I believe they were inflict inflicted before death. Would these be consistent with this individual being dragged somewhere while he was alive? Or <clears throat> Sustained. You're familiar, you've done how many autopsies, sir? About 6,000. And during that time, have you seen and studied uh, the situation where someone is dragged before death? Have you seen that situation before? Yes. How many times would you say? At least three or four times. And looking at that along with your, and have you read up on this area? Is Not there any list? No. Given what you know and what you've seen in your work, and you said that these uh, injuries are before death, would, could that be consistent with someone being dragged? Approach.
may continue. Right. Could those be consistent with somebody being dra dragging him along or him being dragged? Usually what you see in a dragging is you'll see more drawn out abrasions. These look more like impacts to me against something. Um, bruising is usually from stumbling against something or being forced against something. So in other words, this are consistent, more consistent in your view with him hitting something before that? Yes, or something hitting him. How about if we then go to exhibit 190 and which he, this is the right here heel or left heel? That is the left heel. And what do we have here in the back of the left heel? I call them abraded lacerations. So a laceration as opposed to an incised wound is actually a tearing of the skin rather than cutting and it's abraded. So there's an abrasion or a scrape leading into the, to the laceration um, and that is also from a contact with an object of some kind. And again, were these made before or after um, his death? I believe before because they are hemorrhagic. And you said hemorrhagic, that means they were bleeding, right? Bleeding into them, yes. But these do imply some sort of action, correct? I mean, there was movement. A, a force, yes, a blunt force. To go back to this uh, exhibit, which is 191, and looking at the left foot, do you see this right here, that area there by the uh, heel? Yes. Uh, what is that? That is a contusion or a bruise. So that's also the. How is that different than the abrasion that we've talked about? A uh, contusion or a bruise is just bleeding under the skin. Um, the skin is intact, whereas an abrasion or a laceration, the skin is scraped or torn. And if we look at the, he at the knee here, is that a contusion or an abrasion? I would characterize that as an abrasion. And in contrast, the other things we've been talking about, I'd say that, that looks more like a post-mortem change. It's, uh, it's got some drying and it's kind of a yellowish in color, so it really doesn't look like, a, like an anti-mortem or an injury before death. So this could be something after death? Yes. Um, and if an individual, I know it begs the question, but if an individual is dead, they're not gonna be moving around to cause this, right? No. Are, are you then telling me that actually a force was applied to this area as opposed to Mr. Alexander either moving or, or, or striking himself? That's more likely, yes. Let's take a look at uh, exhibits numbers 192 through 199. Are those photographs of the victim's injuries in the back area of his body when you conducted the examination in June of 2008? Uh, yes, and also some images of the head as well. The back part of the head, correct? Uh, yes. Move for the admission of exhibits 192. Exhibits 192 through 199 are admitted. Let's take a look at uh, Exhibit 192. And the 
uh, injuries that jump out of us are these right here. Are you familiar with the term grouping? Yes. Is, is this a grouping of injuries? Yes. And what does that mean to you? Uh, well, more likely than not, they occurred close in time, and um, they, a lot of them, most of them, have the same orientation. When you say that they have the same orientation, what does that mean? And I'll show you exhibit number um, 193. What do we mean about the same orientation? In general, except for one exception that I can see at the lower edge, they're all oriented exactly the same direction. Um, and what direction is that? Uh, they're in a diagonal extending from the right shoulder towards the lower uh, left side of the back. So if these were inflicted like this? Yes. And with one exception, which exception is that? Uh, the lower, there's a pair of, of wounds. It appears that there's one that's sort of going the other direction, the other diagonal. And these injuries that we're talking about that are coming this way like that, would they, could they be consistent with the individual having his back as I have it to you, turn to his attacker and the attacker just stabbing him like that. Yes. How many um, are there here? Uh, starting with this one here, cutting across to the other shoulder, sort of in a triangular fashion, if you will. How many um, stab, how many injuries do we have there? We have nine injuries and they're all clustered together there in the center. Uh, what you're seeing on the upper left side is actually post-mortem artifact. There's some skin slippage there and some drying. Is that, is that what we're talking about there? Yes, or in this all right? of this area here where, where your pen is. And also right here, I, I believe, yes. correct. And you said that there were how many, nine? Nine. Um, are these stab wounds or are they incised wounds? Which is the They're term. stab wounds. So which means that they're deeper than they are longer, correct? Yes. Um, how deep is the deepest one there? They're all about the same depth. They're about an inch deep, and they're going into the back parts of the ribs and the spine, uh, the spinal bone, and stopping there. And none of them, to my exam, uh, none of them entered the chest cavity, although with the decomposition, you can't completely rule that out. When you say that they went up to the, to the bones, does it mean is that, that they stopped there, or did the knife blade continue past the bone? Do we, do we know that, or does decomposition affect that? They appear to all have been stopped by the bones. And that does speak a little bit to the pressure that's being applied to them, right? That they didn't go through the bone, right? It, it depends on the force of the assailant and also the type of weapon that's used. And if you know, um, maybe you do, maybe you don't, you know approximately how much force there was that, that was applied there or not? I couldn't say. It would depend on the thickness of his bones as well. So there are a lot of variables. But needless, they didn't go through the bone, right? Correct. This area here, which is his buttock area, correct? Yes. What, what's, what's going on there? It just looks like it's a little bit red. Um, what, could you tell us what's going on there? Uh, that's lividity. So this person was found in a semi-seated position and the blood had settled to that part. So when the body, when the heart stops beating, the blood will settle to wherever gravity will, will guide it. And so in this case, since he's in a semi-seated position, most of the blood is going to go to the buttock area, and that's why it's kind of got this reddish color. Is part of the decomposition process, does that include gases being inside the body, being formed and then expelled? Is that part of the de decomposition process? Yes. So for example, if in this case, if we had if we do a wound here to the neck, would it be consistent with the decomposition process to have the gases sort of be expelled through that area such that um, liquid or fluid may be come out with the gases? Is that something that could happen? Yes, that's usual. Let's take a look at uh, 194, and I want to look at the right foot. Do you see that right there? that area there and perhaps this area here. Are those bruises or is that just uh, maybe uh, blood or, or discoloration? It's discoloration and also mummification of the sole of the foot, extending up onto the side of the foot. And the left foot, we, um, you see that right there? On, I'm gonna move it up, the knee area, you see that? And is that the one that we talked about that 
probably post-mortem, or is that a different? Uh, that problem? was on the other side, but again, that has the same sort of appearance. It's not the best view, but it looks like a dried, almost like a parchment-like appearance, and that's something that we see with uh, after death. And the left foot has the abrasion, I think you called it. Yeah, there's a contusion on uh -huh. the ankle area, and then also that um, abraded area of laceration on the Achilles tendon. Let's look at exhibit 193 again, and we've talked about this grouping. And we see the head and the neck. Let's take a closer look at that in exhibit 195. What, what, what are we looking at there? This is um, after I've inspected the back of the head, I've shaved some of the hair away to better show the injuries. And what you have here are deep incised wounds, so they're longer than they are deep. Uh, but they are very deep. They're going all the way to the skull. And there's two of them on the back of the scalp. It, it, given the way you described it, and it may have been something that I was reading into it, but it appears that you, the way you described it, that there was some force that was applied to these particular wounds to get to where they got. Well, if, if you have a very sharp blade, it actually wouldn't take very much force at all to cut the, cut the tissue very deeply. All it is is just uh, connective tissue that forms the scalp. Now, to go through the bone, that would, that would be a lot more force that would be needed. And this one right here, how long is that one? I have it as uh, two inches on the autopsy report. And what above it? <coughs> two inches as well. The fact that the hair is there, does that affect um, the strength needed to get into the, or get this sort of injury, or is that just something that the hair really is not something that you deal with or think about? His hair is very short. I mean, if he had longer, bushier hair, it might, it might uh, cushion the head somewhat or protect the head, but in this case, he's got short hair, so I don't think it played, played a role. Taking a look at uh, Exhibit 198, what are we looking at there? Uh, what you actually see here are the, uh, the edges, uh, and it's only in one portion of those incised ones we saw. Uh, there was some force applied that was sufficient to cause a divot in the skull bone. So this is actually after the skull, uh, the scalp has been reflected away from the skull. And what you're seeing here is actually a divot in the center of the skull. And then over on the left side, you see another one, and there's hemorrhage around those. So the, the bone was actually sort of chipped away by the end of the implement there. We take a look at Exhibit 199. What are we looking at there? This, to me, is the tip of, a, of an implement, probably the tip of a knife or something similar, because it has this very triangular profile. And this is the bone, and the piece of bone has actually been chipped away by the end of the, of the object. If we go back to Exhibit number 195, what this divot uh, in Exhibit 199, where was it, uh, as, it so, as, as it applies to these two? Right. There's one at the extreme left end of the longer wound at the bottom. Right here? And then one towards the middle of the top wound. Right here? Yes. So we're looking at there, and we're looking at there. When we look at exhibit number 198, you're looking at here and here. Yes. Exhibit 196, the focus on the area that's down here to the bottom. And also to the front, if you will, of the head. Take a look at Exhibit 197. In terms of these two injuries that we saw back there, where is this one now? This one's actually uh, towards the front of the head. So you're looking at the top of the head near the hairline on the forehead. At the very bottom, you'll see uh, Mr. Alexander's eyebrow, his left eyebrow. So this is a small incised wound uh, at the forehead near the hairline. On and the any of these wounds that we've been talking about, the ones with the sharp instrument, are they any of those after death or are they all pre-death? I think they're all pre-death. They all have bleeding associated with them. Take a look at uh, exhibits 200 and 201. What are we looking at there? 
the uh, right side of Mr. Alexander's neck behind the ear. And these are also were taken at the time of the your examination. Yes. Proof for the admission of the two hundred and two hundred one. Two hundred and two hundred one are admitted. So far, how many of those have been the type that would have been fatal of all the ones that we've looked at so far? The head, the back, and then the one to the front. Taken together, all the wounds of the back and the head could have been fatal from bleeding over time. Um, the most significant wounds are going to be the neck wound, which we haven't talked about yet, the stab wound that penetrates the heart and the vein leading into the heart, and then also the gunshot wound, which we also haven't discussed. All right, let's take a look at uh, Exhibit 200. And um, what are we looking at here? This is another stab wound of the back part of the skull behind the ear. So there's bone underneath there. It goes down into that bony area and also goes into the muscle, uh, the strap muscle that is on the side of the head below the ear. And we're looking at 201. How big is that one? One and one quarter inch. Exhibit number 202, what are we looking at there? That is the back opposite side of the neck on the left side of the neck and that's another stab wound. I move for the admission of Exhibit 202. No objection. Exhibit 202 is admitted. What do we see here? Let's say another stab wound to the back left side of the neck, and that also penetrates into uh, muscle on the back of the neck. And how long is that one? One inch. Take a look at uh, exhibits 203 through 206. And what do they portray? Uh, the largest wound of the neck um, across the throat. No objection. Exhibits 203 through 206 are admitted. to um, tell, for example, uh, if it started on the left side or the right side? Do you know by looking at these um, where the wound may have started or not? I'm not able to say. Take a look at uh, 203. Okay, what are we looking at? I guess we'll do this. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is a side view of the neck wound, and, and it's probably one of the better views to show how deep it goes. And how deep is this wound? What, what is it that was cut as this uh, knife came through the... Okay, referring to my autopsy report. Sure. Uh, it passes through um, the airway, so the windpipe is cut through. Let me stop um, you there. When it passes through the airway, does this individual, as it's going through there, lose, lose the ability to scream at that point or not? It's uh, below the larynx, below the voice box, so yes. 
And if this person, well, this person's alive at this point, according to you, right? He was yes. still alive at the time yes. this was inflicted. Would the, where would the blood start coming out as, as a result of this wound here? Well, right next to the windpipe are the major vessels of the neck. So you've got the carotid artery, you've got the jugular vein, and on the right side, not the left, but on the right okay, side. Let's take a look at exhibit number 204. That's the right side, correct? Yes. Uh, you're not going to be able to see it in this picture to any great advantage, but uh, my examination did show uh, that the jugular vein and the carotid artery on the right side were both cut. And I, looking at this, how, how deep is this wound that we have here? Uh, it goes all the way back to the spine, so it's uh, three inches, four inches. And um, if a person were to have the spine cut off, is that where the feeling stops and they don't feel anything? Or yeah, It doesn't go through the spinal cord, so it, it doesn't penetrate that bone. So it's actually the soft tissue and structures of the front of the neck and then stops at the bone. Exhibit 205, what are um, we looking at here? And this is a frontal view of the same wound. Uh, in looking at this, do you see how it's my term scalloped? Yes, um, there, there's some irregularity, and a lot of that is due to the, um, the drying of the wound that's happened after death. Uh, it, if you inspect the edges of the wound, it is actually a cleanly incised wound, and it's retracted a bit and gotten a bit larger after death because the tissue has dried and retracted away. Are you familiar with the term hesitation marks? That's yes. Are there, and what are hesitation marks? Uh, very occasionally we'll get suicides like this. We'll get people that cut their own throat, and it's very unusual for them to just cut their throat. They will do shallow cuts, and they'll sort of do test cuts, and then they'll do a deep cut. Um, so we call those little smaller cuts hesitation marks, and we don't see anything like that here. Exhibit 206, um, what, are you, what are you doing here? I'm trying to show the profile of the wound a bit better, uh, put the wound together so we have sort of an idea of what the wound looked like before it separated. And you see this right here? Is that, is that an indication of where it started or you can't tell where it started? I can't say whether it started on the right or the left, but it's across the neck. Once this was inflicted, what kind of wound is this? We talked about the one that's in the chest and you said, well, that's not immediately fatal uh, and the person would be conscious. Once this was inflicted on Mr. Alexander, um, is this something that's, number one, rapidly fatal, and number two, um, what about lapsing into unconsciousness? If you could have talked to us about those two aspects. Well, he has two major vessels in his throat that have been cut. Uh, he's going to lose a great deal of blood very quickly. He's going to lose consciousness within seconds, likely, and then die a few minutes later. So if an individual receives this wound, would it be, would he be able to get up and walk, let's say, 12 feet, 6 inches somewhere? Yes. He, he could, could get that. up and walk a couple of feet. That's possible. He could move. Yes. And then he would? Collapse. And in terms of in unconsciousness, so how much time are we talking about? A few seconds, probably. And death, how long would it take for this person to die if this was the only injury? If this was the only injury, again, uh, probably a few minutes. In this case, though, you've, you've seen that there were other injuries, and uh, you also alluded to the fact that there was a gunshot wound, right? Yes. Let's take a look at uh, exhibits 207 through 210. And what do those deal with? They show the, uh, the gunshot wound of Mr. Alexander's right forehead. And we also have the, uh, the bullet. Did you recover it? Yes. Move for the admission of exhibits numbers 207 to 207 through 210 are admitted.
Exhibit 207. Um, what is this right here? That's a gunshot entrance wound. And what's the trajectory of this gunshot wound? It uh, passes down through the skull, um, passes through the face and uh, downward and to the left, and terminates in the left cheek. In looking at this, are you able to tell or give us a determination as to the distance between the muzzle and his temple? I'm not. Uh, I, I call it an indeterminate range. Uh, I don't have sooting, I don't have stippling, um, any of the indicators of a range of fire here. So we really can't tell how far away it was. That's right. And 208 just shows us that same injury with the ruler next to it, right? Yes. Exhibit 209, what do we see there? That is the left cheek, and I've made an incision and removed the bullet here. This bullet and the trajectory that you've described, did it affect the brain at all? In other words, did it strike the brain or not? It must have. It passed through the, uh, the front right portion of the skull. Uh, the problem in this case is that the brain is decomposed and the brain is, is a very soft structure to begin with, so it, it falls apart very rapidly after death. Uh, so I was not able to see a track through the brain, but just because the, the bullet passes through the front part of the skull where the brain normally would be, I have to conclude that the brain was perforated. And if the brain is perforated, what would happen to this individual once he was shot? He'd be incapacitated. Went down? Yes. Immediately? Rapidly, yes. Exhibit 210 is what? That's the bullet after recovery. Let me show you Exhibit 244. If you want, go ahead and open it. You need that, you know, I need your bigger glove there. Do I need to view it or um, do you prefer that I did? Yeah, let me go ahead and get you some scissors. This is the uh, evidence canister, uh, which would be containing that projectile that was recovered. And those are my initials. All right, you don't mind putting it back. I move for the admission of exhibit 244. Okay. 244 is admitted. Alexander die. What was the mechanism of death? In other words, um, how did he die? Primarily blood loss. And tell me how that works on the body in terms of the blood loss and what that does to the individual as he dies. Well, after you lose blood, you lose the ability to provide oxygen to your major organs, including your brain and your heart. Um, in this case, uh, the first thing that would happen would be dizziness followed by loss of consciousness and then death. In this particular case, you've indicated that there are three uh, specific injuries that could have led to death. We talked about the stab wound in the chest, we talked about the slitting of the throat, and then we've talked about the shot to the head. With regard to the uh, shot to the head, uh, would that have been rapidly fatal? Likely would have been. And by rapidly fatal, what are we talking about? Well, you, if you have a projectile going through the front part of the brain, uh, the person may not die immediately, but they'll probably lose the ability to function normally. They'll lose consciousness, and they'll be laying on the floor. Short, in short, very short order. No yes. Words, shot, they go down. Yes. How about the slashing to the throat in terms of uh, whether or not it's rapidly fatal or not? I think by far it's the most significant injury. And, uh, and why do you say that? 
well, it's just the most uh, hemorrhagic injury. It's the one that I can demonstrate the most significant injury to the structures that are going to cause death, like the carotid artery, the windpipe, and the jugular vein. And then the one to the heart, is that, I think we've talked about it, but in terms of rapidly fatal, less, less fatal, um, which of these, if we're going to apply that standard as to which are the most fatal, how about the one to the chest? Is that the most fatal or the least fatal? Which probably, may not be the probably problem. the middle. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's a significant injury. It would it would definitely cause death without medical attention. And would that cause unconsciousness in, immediately? Yes. Uh, not immediately. Okay. Not the chest wound. No. From what I'm hearing you say, of the three that we've talked about, two of them, the one to the neck, and the one to the gunshot to the head, those appear, from what I hear you saying, that those would cause unconsciousness quickly. Immediate. Immediate. Yes. And the one to the chest would not. Less likely. So if that's the scenario, and in this case we have the um, defensive wounds to the hands, what does that tell you about the sequencing of these three injuries? I believe the wounds to the hands must have occurred before the fatal injuries, either of the head or of the throat. And so what you're saying is that at some point during the stabbing, uh, but before the slashing of the throat and before the gunshot to the head, this individual grabbed the knife. Or, or attempted or, or, to. Or the knife was applied. Objection, leading. Rephrase. Tell me about the sequencing of events as it applies to the two injuries, and one to the head and the slitting of the throat, and when this individual may have grabbed the knife or the knife was applied to his hands. With the throat wound and the head wound, I don't think this person could have had a purposeful activity, meaning I don't think they could have raised their arms and attempted to defend themselves. With the chest wound, uh, that's possible because he would not have been immediately um, unconscious. In terms then between the other two, so that would mean then that it would appear that, in your opinion, the first wound would have been the one to the chest. Rephrase. Which one, which one would have been first in your opinion? Well, the stab wound could have occurred, and then the defensive injuries could have happened after the, after the wound of the chest occurred. Right, okay. And then, in terms of the sequence of the injuries involving the three major ones that we talked about, what is your opinion? Well, the throat injuries and or the head wound are going to be immediately incapacitating, and he's not going to attempt to defend himself after that. Okay. Uh, in terms of the shot to the head, do you have any opinion as to whether or not he was alive at the time that that shot was struck? I can't say. Do you have an opinion as to the wound to the neck, whether or not he was alive at the time that that was uh, rendered, if you will? I believe he was. There's a great deal of hemorrhage associated with that. And was he alive with regard to the one to the chest that we've been talking about? Yes, I believe he was. Can you tell with regard to the gunshot wound to the right temple whether or not he was alive or not at that point? Uh, again, there's a wound going through the head, and I don't see hemorrhage in the brain. I can't see a wound track through the brain, so all I know is that there's a bullet going through the brain, so I can't say with certainty. And if we don't see hemorrhaging or bleeding, as you talked about, is that an indication that the person was already dead? They may have been, yes. I don't have any other questions, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the afternoon recess. Please be back in the designated area at 10 minutes after three, and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition, you are excused.